And would you please stand and join me in a word of prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you this morning for the opportunity and the privilege to gather together to celebrate the life of our brother. We thank you for the service that he's given to this country, and more importantly, the service that he's given you as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Father, we realize that it has come to that time when you desire to have him in your presence and not in ours. And we know that we will miss his presence among us because of the gifts and the abilities that you've given him. But Lord, we ask that you would indeed pour out your spirit this time to bring comfort and strength, healing and encouragement to those of us that are here and waiting for that time that we might be in your presence also. Father, we want to give you this time for your honor as we gather to celebrate and honor the life of our brother. And we ask these things now in Jesus' most holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. I'd like to begin this morning by reading to you from the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 1. This is the Apostle Paul, and he was speaking of a very time in his life just like this in Daniel's life. It was the time of his departure. And he says, we know that when this tent that we live in now is taken down, when we die, when we leave these bodies, we have wonderful new bodies in heaven, homes that will be ours forevermore, made for us by God himself and not by human hands. And how weary we grow in our present bodies. And that's why we look forward eagerly to the day when we shall have heavenly bodies, which we shall put on like new clothes. We shall not merely be spirits without bodies. These earthly bodies make us groan and sigh. And we wouldn't like to think of dying not having any body at all. We want to slip into our new bodies so that these dying bodies will, as it were, be swallowed up by everlasting life. And this is what God has prepared for us. And as a guarantee, he's given us the Holy Spirit. So now we look forward with confidence to our heavenly bodies, realizing that every moment we spend in these earthly bodies is time spent away from our eternal home in heaven with Jesus. We're not afraid but are quite content to die, for then we will be at home with the Lord. So we gather here today to honor the memory of Daniel Morgan Dyer. We gather to comfort those of his family and friends by our presence and by our words. And finally, we're here today to hear what God would say to us through his word about the realities of life, death, and eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ. You've come today because in some way or another, your life has been touched by Daniel Dyer. You're his family, you're his friends, and some here today will have the opportunity to share about the things that he meant to you. And memories like those will continue to live in our hearts. They're very precious. Many of them are beyond what words can describe. But each of you gives testimony of how highly you thought of Daniel by being here today. Daniel Morgan Dyer was born March 29, 1930 in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Born again March 29th on his birthday, 1976, the centennial year. He departed from this place May 17, 2013, 83 years young. And I say young because most of you that are over 30 realize that time is on the short end. And that compared to eternity, 80 is really nothing. There's a long time to live in eternity. Daniel graduated from William Christman High School, Independence, Missouri, earned an associate's degree from Graceland University in Iowa, his bachelor's and master's from uh, Cal State, uh, University of California, Long Beach. Uh, I wanted to list his military service, but it was so great that fortunately someone has prepared a sheet for each of you, and I would encourage you to read that. It's, it's incredible the amount of service that this man was able to perform in his lifetime. I, we don't have the opportunity to list all the posts that he served during active duty and after, but, I, but uh, you will have an idea of his service by the amount of decorations. I don't know if you notice the pictures out there, but there's an incredible amount of fruit salad there. And uh, if you read again through the listings here, it's a very long paragraph. I have never met someone with so many uh, incredible badges and ribbons and commendations. In 
January 5th, 1952, Daniel married the love of his life, Pat Gilbertson. She became his wife. Daniel worked for the city of Long Beach, eventually retired as Parks and Recreation Department Manager, 28 years of service, became an ordained minister in 1980, served as Director of Operations for Campus Crusade Conference Center at Arrowhead Springs, uh, and you'll also see in there that he was a part of Civil Air Patrol and Semper Fi, honor detail, so many, many things. And again, until recently, attended weekly Bible studies at the Packing House Christian Fellowship in Redlands, California. Uh, his professional organizations include Phi Sigma Epsilon, Chosen Few Association, Sea Going Marines Association, USS Valley Forge, CB 45 Association, Disabled Veterans Association, ER Coop Owners Association, and Purple Heart Association. Quite a few accomplishments. Daniel leaves behind his wife of 61 years, Patricia. Three children, Michael Dyer, Rick Schmidt, and Shirley Earl. And they have five grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Our sympathy and our prayers are certainly with you at this time. But for the rest of us, we need to remember that Daniel also leaves us behind. Because his life has not ended, it's entered into a brand new dimension. That is eternal life. Because the scripture teaches us life does not end with death as we think about it in natural situations. Life has eternal consequences and we will all live forever. We know that Daniel is living forever in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have a few people that would like to share some of their special memories of Daniel Dyer. And again, according to time constraints, we can't allow everybody to come and share like we'd like to. Uh, we do have to be at national at a specific time. So I'd like to ask Sergeant Matt McLean to please come to the podium and uh, share with us. Good morning. Again, as Pastor Bob said, my name is Mike McClain. I'm the president of Simplify One, which is a all-volunteer marine organization. Uh, we have veterans from every war, from World War II to the Afghanistan War. Uh, Dan was a member of our organization and also a member of a, another group, Blank Hours, made up of all the branches of service, a group called the All Forces Unit. Uh, I'm up here today and I feel honored to be in front of you. I'm up here today because of a man who I consider not only my friend, but my mentor. Gunnar Dyer was the type of individual that if I had to make a decision that I knew was not going to be well received by everyone, I would go to Gunnar Dyer to get, his, to get some type of insight. I did this because I knew he would not only be supportive of me, but he would also, he would be honest with me on his opinion. Uh, Dan and I was the type of person, just a great person. I, I did not realize how many things he had done in his life. Uh, when he called me and told me that he was, he very nonchalantly said, Mac, I have some bad news. He says, uh, my doctor's given me two weeks to live. He said it in such a easy going nonchalant way, it caught me off guard. I thought I had misunderstood what he said. But I guess when you are a man that has made your peace with God, and you know where you're going, it becomes a lot easier. Uh, Dan, again, with some of his accomplishments and achievements, I can say when I start reading, like Pastor Bob said, I can only say that his accomplishments and achievements in life were only surpassed by his contributions to life. The things he contributed, not only to his country, but to mankind. Dan Dyer was one of those people that everybody loved. He was always joking, always happy. You know, when I invited him to be a guest speaker a couple years ago, I thought I knew everything I knew about Dan Dyer. I found out I didn't. When we got up and I started hearing about all the accolades, I knew about his military career. I knew he had fought in one of the most uh, glorified, one of the, the most 
memorable battles in the history of the United States Marine Corps, the Chosen Reservoir. Wounded three times, uh, Arnold was awarded the, the Bronze Star and survived that battle. I knew about that. I had no idea about the ukulele playing. The, uh, <laughs> the, uh, I mean, his, having a doctorate degree, you're just an amazing person. And I think when I, I look back on that, you think about it. When you look at a tombstone and you look at it, it says uh, the date of birth, which is important, the date of death, which is important, and then you have the little dash in between. Well, I think the course of life is that dash. And I'm sure you've heard that before, but that dash is what reflects on the person. It's good to be born, probably good to be died if you're a Christian or you believe. But the thing in reality is that what is between? What did you contribute to life? Dan Dyer was the type of person who contributed quite a bit to life, probably more than most people did. Uh, my favorite president, Ronald Reagan, once said, there are people who go their entire life wondering, did I make a difference? He said the Marines don't have that problem. And I feel the same way about Dan Dyer. I'm just going to say it again. There are people who go through this entire life, go through their life, wondering, did I make a difference? Gunnar Dan Dyer definitely made a difference. When we visited uh, Dan at the hospital, we decided to line up all of the troops to salute him. And we had everybody in uniform. We lined up against the wall. Dan starts, uh, they bring him down, they transport him from the fourth floor to the first. They have him on the gurney. It was the first time I'd seen him like this. As they're bringing him in on the gurney, I walked up to him and I go, it's gun. Look up, I have all these Marines with him. So we all gave him a salute as he was coming in. As we were saluting, he started saying a, a poem. He started reciting this poem. And this poem is a poem that we read any time we bury a Marine. And the poem goes something like this, if I can remember. Till the last landings are made, and we stand on a grave, on a shore which no mortal has seen. Till the last bugle call plays taps for us all. Simple to tell us, Marine. And I could just remember Dan saying that over and over again as we were, they were bringing me into the grave. I visited Dan for three days. The first two days, he was the old dad. He was telling jokes to keep us in good spirits. Joking with the staff. On the third day, he had slipped into an unconscious state. And we sit there for about two and a half hours trying to talk to him, saying words for him to see if we could get a response. We finally knew that it was, it was over with was coming, the near dam was coming here. So as I had to leave, I rest down. I gently kissed him on the forehead. And I said to him, simple for that was morning. I love you and I will always miss you. As I walked down that hall, and for those of you who visit him, you know the hall is a very long hall. This is the end of the building. As I walk down the hall, I now refer to that hall as the longest and loneliest walk of my life. I was afraid to look back because I knew my friend, I would never see him alive again. So I made that walk. And again, I will never forget that. So in closing, I would just like to close with one thing. That when Gandhi, the peacemaker of India, died, Nehru, the gentleman who would later become the Prime Minister of India, gave his eulogy. At his eulogy, he quoted these words. Although short, they were very pointed. The words were, in reference to Gandhi, he said, the light that shone 
in this country was no ordinary light. And I would like to say that for Gunnar Dan Dyer. The light that shone in this country, Dan Dyer, was no ordinary light. Even though the light is dim, it's somewhat dim today, in the hearts and the minds of his friends and family, that light will always shine. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time today. And with that, I will step down and I have just a couple of packets to give to the family. And thank you again. God bless you all. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask Mel Wilkinson to please come to the podium. I'm sharing on behalf of the, the Wednesday morning uh, men's Bible study that Dan was uh, quite a part of, really. Um, he was a regular participant, and I scarcely remember him missing the study over the last 14 years. Uh, even with his recent illness, he usually attended, assuring us he was doing fine when we asked. He was always upbeat and ready to joke. He contributed wit or a quick pun. If you knew Dan, you knew he loved his puns. He was our chronographer. If we needed to know when we started studying a book or a passage, Dan had the dates written in his Bible. In December, he always brought candy canes for everyone with a story attached about how the inventor intended them to represent the true meaning of Christmas. Dan was actually in a conflict other than Korea. And decisions he made in that conflict made him who he was. In those hostilities, Dan actually surrendered. He surrendered his life to Jesus Christ. Dan was a committed Christian. He served his country, but he lived for a different kingdom, a kingdom of doing what is right regardless of the cost, a kingdom comprised of higher standards than those of this world a kingdom where service and humility reap eternal honor. Dan was, the, Dan was the man we respect because he served God. My favorite Dan story comes from his years at Campus Crusade for Christ. The organization was doing evangelism door to door in town. Novices were paired with veterans. Dan was teamed with a young college graduate. At one home, the man answered the door and Dan began his gospel presentation. The homeowner cursed him and moved to slam the door in Dan's face. Just before the door closed, with all of his marine demeanor, Dan uttered, then go to hell. <laughs> incredulously asked, what did you say? Dan refined the statement with, if you don't want to listen, you're going to go to hell. To that the fellow said, get in here, and held the door open. Dan led that gentleman to the Lord that day. That evening, at the Campus Crusade get-together, teams were invited to share their stories. Dan knew he was in trouble when the young lady he was teamed with got up and in front of all of the Campus Crusade brass excitedly told the story. Eyes rolled. Dan was informed that was not the type of example they wanted. But those of us who knew Dan loved it. He was not some puppet. The message came through the personality of the man. To this, day, we, we, to this day, we refer to his sharing tactics as the Dan Dyer School of Evangelism. <laughs> Dan had vanity license plates that read, Chosen One. He never said anything about his Korea service. So as he was leaving one morning, I asked him whether the license plate represented the Chosen Reservoir. Dan responded that the plates had double meaning. Yes, Korea but it also meant that he was one called to serve Christ. To explain that double meaning, 
Here's a paraphrase of Romans 8, verses 28 and 29. We know that God works everything together for good to, for those who love him. They are the people who have been called in his divine will and purpose. God knew his people in advance and chose them. He chose them to be like his son. God's desire was for a family that would express the lovely life of their older brother, Jesus. The place where one finds peace is greater than the place of war. Dan may have fought at Chosen, but he walked well in life because he was Chosen. Dan called me the afternoon he received the diagnosis and informed me he had about two to three weeks. I drove down to see him and we talked about death. When I asked whether he was okay with the prognosis, he responded with a Bible verse, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Three days later, we visited again in more detail about how, for a believer in Jesus Christ, death is not something to be feared, but rather a gateway to the final step of our salvation, getting a new body fit for our new environment, heaven. We go to sleep here and we, we wake up there. Dan knew this beyond any doubt. He had no fear for himself. There was nothing he needed to settle with God. His only concern was for his wife, Pat. I choked with emotion when I got the phone call that Dan was gone. It was sweet sorrow. He would be greatly missed, but he was also free from the confines of a body taken over by cancer. Dan was ready. Dan did not enter peace when he died. He was already at peace. He had no anxiety about death. In fact, I think he yearned for it. We're honored to have had him as a part of our lives. Thank you, Mel. I'd like to ask I'm Lieutenant Colonel Paul Ward Chaplain. I am represent the Pacific Region. But more than that, I also represent the National Commander of Civil Air Patrol, Major General Chuck Carr, uh, the National Chief of Chaplains, J. Delano Ellis II, the Chief of Chaplains, and Colonel Larry Myrick, who is the Pacific Region Commander. And on behalf of the organization and our chaplain corps, we'd like to extend our collective condolences but also grateful appreciation to the Dyer family for your supporting Dan in his 35 years of service to our organization. Dan also was a Marine, as everybody knows, 41 years, 35 years in Civil Air Patrol. And what those two organizations have in common is we both have creeds. Super Fidelis, Super Fi, always faithful. Super Vigilance, always diligent, always vigilant, always alert. And that was Dan, always, never wavering. He was always faithful to whatever task he was given, and he was always alert to the needs and the cares of others. Uh, the Lord only knows the immensity of the influence and impact that Dan had on everyone's life, especially within the chapel corps. I was a benefactor. In 1997, he took me under his wing, and he was the region chaplain, and he molded me and shaped me. And he did that to so many others in our chaplain corps. He gave of himself. We always listened to what Dan had to say because he knew, number one, it was going to be honest. Dan never, never shied away from his convictions. He always stood by what he felt and what he felt needed to be done. He was always truthful. And there's a couple of things that I learned from Dan. A couple of life principles. Number one, be fair, be firm, have fun. And if you know Dan, we had fun. And he also had another philosophy. Take your job, not yourself, seriously. So when he was in Japan on IAS, International Air Cadet Exchange Program, he picked up a uniform item that was not authorized by the Civil Air Patrol. But Chaplain Dyer insisted that Chaplain Ingram in the back and myself as the encampment staff and then when we were at National Board, we would wear this. <laughs> and so Dan, this is for you. 
Love you, my brother. We'll see you again soon. Thank you, Colonel. I'd like to ask Chris Duncan to please come to the podium. Cliff Duncan, I'm sorry. Good morning, everybody. My name is Cliff Duncan. I have the honor of having known Dan longer than anybody else. I served him with him in Korea from the Busan perimeter to the Chosen Reservoir. He was a wonderful Marine, a great friend. He was the original happy warrior, and my memories are wonderful. God bless him and his family. Semper Fidelis. Thank you, sir. I'd like to ask Pastor Darrell Sutton to please come. Good morning, my name is Daryl Sun. The day of his passing, I visualized the American eagle with a giant tear coming down from his beak. For Dan was truly an American eagle, one of the few, as we've heard, to walk out with frozen feet from one of the most horrific battles that's ever taken place. But from the first time that I met my friend Dan, I sensed his great loyalty to what he believed and what was right and justified to him. And his commitment was second to none. And I knew, I knew that if God could ever get a hold of that heart, he would have a powerful warrior. And as we've seen with all of these ministries and all of these things that he has accomplished and, and being with Pastor, what a, what a dynamic, dynamic life. You know, I'm reminded of Charles Plum, who was a U.S. Navy pilot in Vietnam. After 75 combat, combat missions, his plane was destroyed by a surface-to-air missile. Plum was ejected and parachuted into the enemy's hands. He spent six years in a communist Vietnamese prison. He survived the ordeal. And one day, Plum and his wife were sitting at a restaurant. A man at another table came up and said, You're Plum! You flew fighter pilots from Vietnam, from the aircraft Kitty Hawk. You were shot down. How in the world would you know that, Plum asked. He says, I packed your parachute. The man replied, Plum grasped, he just gasped back and he was out of surprise and gratitude. And the, the man pumped his hand and said, I guess it worked. <laughs> it sure did. If the shirt had a shoot hadn't worked, I wouldn't be here today. So we ask ourselves, who's packing your parachute? Everyone has someone they need to make it through the day. And all we need is a lot of different kinds of parachutes. We all need physical parachutes, mental parachutes, emotional parachutes, and spiritual parachutes. But that brings me to my friend Dan. Dan was someone who packed all my parachutes. When I first met uh, Dan, I was an individual by the grace of God of life. I wasn't some spiritual giant. I wasn't a preacher of the gospel. I wasn't a pastor of a church. I wasn't a pastor of a ministry. I was a person that had made a lot of mistakes. And by the grace of God and his prayers, my mother's prayers, my sister's prayers, Pat Dyer's prayers and her family. 
though was delivered from a fifth life in a state prison to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's because of God's amazing grace through people like Dan that I'm who I am today. And there's no doubt in my mind that the power of living God came through him. Dan displayed God's grace and love to me and invested in my life and packed my parachutes. His sense of humor was classic. Anyone that knew him never escaped without at least a couple laughs. Dan Dyer was a disciplined war hero, yet he never judged me. Whenever he met and shared with me, he just packed my parachutes. He packed my emotions. He'd always give me a word. He'd always say, you're going to do good. You're all right. And I believed him. And I put that into action. And thank God for his amazing grace. I love Dan Dyer, but I know he's in a better place. He's with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And with his sense of humor, as only Dan could put it, he asked me to share with you, don't, don't tell them not to worry about me. They think gold is riches? I wish it is a rug. <laughs> Dan died. What a treasure. Semper Fi. Hoo-ha. Hoo-ha. It's a difficult time for many people, and often we speak of it as a time of loss. I'd like to share with you one of my favorite quotes. It was by Dr. Vance Havner, who at the time was the chaplain to the U.S. Senate. He said, when you know where someone is, they're not lost. We know where Dan Dyer is today. He's not lost, and we're not here because of a loss. We know where he is, and we know we can be where he is. It's at times like this, though, that we need words of certainty, not just words of revelation, just words of comfort. Those are great, but we need the word of God, that God can be our comfort in this time of need. Psalm 145 tells us, the Lord is near unto all them that call upon him, and all who call upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those that fear him. He will hear their cry, he will save them. And Isaiah 41, 10, Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed. I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand, saying unto you, Fear not, I will help you. And as we're gathered here today, and I know that Dan did this too, as we're gathered here, we're reminded of the realities of life and death. Jesus didn't teach much on death. As Christians, we go to the Word of God, to the Bible, to find out what God would say on these things. And if you look for funerals in there, what you're going to find is Jesus always raised the dead. He was all about life. Abundant life now, you've seen that in Dan's life, and eternal life after this abundant life. And that's what Dan is doing today. You see, death wasn't natural in the very beginning when God placed man in the garden, Adam and Eve, he also gave them the tree of life. God intended that we live forever. It's not a part of our makeup, and that's why we have such a difficult time dealing with it. It's not something we like. It's not something we want to talk about. It's not something we want to spend time on. But we all know it's something that's going to come. You see, life is generous to some people. Dan lived 63 years, over 63 years, just over. Many are not given that much time, and, and we can be thankful that he lived a good life. He had the opportunity to see his family grow up before him. We can be thankful that he had the opportunity to share his wisdom, his experiences, both good and bad, with his family and his friends, those he loved. He had the opportunity to live, and your lives have been enriched by knowing Dan. But we're also reminded again that life is limited for all people, and however long we live, death inevitably comes. Even with all the advance in medical technology, we have never succeeded in defeating death. We will all die. But death is a transition. Although the body ceases to function, we know that the spirit lives on. That which perishes is exchanged for that which is imperishable. Death ushers us into the presence of the living God. Death brings us into eternity. 
Death is not really death if you know the Lord. Death is not death if it kills no part of us except that which hinders us from the perfect life. Death is not death if it raises us in a moment from darkness into light, weakness into strength, sinfulness into holiness. Death is not death if it perfects our faith by sight and lets us behold Him in whom we have believed. Death is not death if it rids us of doubt and fear of sickness and disease and sorrow and sadness. Death is not death for Christ has conquered death for Himself and all those who trust in Him. You see, God allowed death for our good. When man sinned, he was separate from God. God did not want man to live forever in sin, in that place of separation. So he did a couple of things. Number one is he removed man from the garden so that he couldn't partake of the tree of life and live forever in that sinful condition. And he gave us another tree. It's called the cross of Jesus Christ, which restores hope and gives us life eternal. Scripture tells us that life is brief. You read the book of James. We don't know what's going to be tomorrow. We know that life is like a vapor. It appears for a time and it vanishes away. And we've all asked questions. What happens after this life? Where, where do I go? What happens after I die? And, and the Lord does not want us to be ignorant about those things. In the scripture, he says so, 1 Thessalonians, the apostle Paul writing says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brothers, concerning those which are asleep, that you sorrow as others who have no hope. We sorrow to a degree because we miss someone that is loved and cared for, and yet we have the hope of joining him soon in a forever family reunion, in our home, in the presence of the Lord. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even also those which sleep in Jesus, God will bring with him. This is the promise of a resurrection body. We read in 2 Timothy, now is made manifest by the appearing of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who has abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. In the book of John, the 11th chapter, we do find Jesus attending a funeral. It's one of his dear friends. And I, I don't know if you remember the story. If you haven't, you can look it up, John 11. And in there you'll see that Jesus actually waited for Lazarus to die. Everybody knew about Jesus' ministry of healing, that Jesus could touch the blind and give them sight, that Jesus could touch the sick and bring healing to them. But he's going to do something different here. And he waited. And he went to approach the home, and he was met by Lazarus' sister, Martha. And she was a little bit upset. She said, Lord, if you'd only gotten here, my brother wouldn't have died. Now, the truth is, he would, maybe later on. But she was upset. And Jesus didn't respond directly to her. He says something interesting. I am the resurrection and the life. And he that believes in me, yet shall he live. And whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this? That was Christ's question to Mary. And I believe it's his question to each and every one of us here today. Do you believe this? That Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. We have a choice. As Sergeant mentioned earlier, there's that dash in between the dates during our life. We have a choice. In that life, we are born once, and we have a choice to reject Jesus Christ and die physically and be dead spiritually. That is not annihilation. That is separation from eternity in the presence of God. What a, what a loss. Or we have the choice after we're born physically to be born again spiritually by receiving Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, just as we know that Dan did, and live eternally. We may face a physical death, but we live eternally in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ. The question for today is, which side are you on? Jesus told us that he would prepare a place for us. The book of John, chapter 14. He says, don't let your heart be troubled. You don't have to worry about what's going to happen after this life. He said, if you believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. I got to tell you, that verse gets me excited. I look around the earth. I see some of the creation of God, the beaches, the mountains, the, the, the incredible sunsets he paints for us daily. And that took six days. 
He's been gone to prepare a place for us for 2,000 years. That is incomprehensible. I can hardly wait to see that place. And I'm a little bit jealous because Dan is there enjoying the pleasures of heaven. In my Father's house are many mansions, and I go to prepare a place for you. And I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you might be also. In other words, this is a promise from Jesus Christ. At the moment we are ready to depart this plane, He's the one that comes to receive us. It's not angels that carry us away or anything else. He comes personally. And we close our eyes here and open them in heaven. And that's where Dan is today. Death for a Christian is several things. Number one, it's hopeful. Proverbs 14 tells us, The wicked is driven away in his wickedness, but the righteous has hope in his death. It is fearless. Psalm 23 tells us, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's great gain. We read in Philippians, For me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. It is precious. Psalm 116 tells us, Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. And I just imagine the Lord saying to Dan on that last day, you know what, they've had you long enough. It's time to come home. You're precious to me. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. It's a rest. We read in the book of Revelation chapter 14. I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. It's a time of departure. Paul writes, I'm now ready to be offered the time of my departure is at hand. I fought the good fight. I finished my course. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. I think Dan could have said that same thing when he got the diagnosis from the doctor. When he called his friends, he could say, I fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. And I know there's a crown waiting for me. We're here today to celebrate Daniel Dyer's coronation. He's received that crown of righteousness. In light of this, this corruptible must put on incorruption. This mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. In Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes, Death, where is your sting? Grave, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God that gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. My question for you, you don't have to answer to me, but my question is, are you here today to say goodbye to Dan? Or are you here to say, I'll see you later? I'm coming. The reality of death, once again, is that we all die. We can't change that. But we can do something about eternity. If we do not commit our life to Christ and serve Him, then to die is an eternal loss. The realities of heaven and hell confront us as we consider death. But the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ is that we can be forgiven of our sins and enjoy God's presence forever. We do not have to fear death because death is not death if it transports us into eternal life. Right now, if you're not sure where you would spend eternity, I invite you to ask Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior from sin by an act of will, trusting in Him. I believe, and I think many of you know, that if Daniel could come here today and speak to this assembled group, he would tell you of the importance of preparing for eternity. Some of you already have, but if you have not, I, along with Daniel, would invite you to make that commitment today. What could be a more fitting time? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for revealing to us what lies beyond death. 
for giving us the Holy Scriptures and for authenticating them through the wonderful evidences and making them sure through the evidence of Christ's resurrection. Thank you for the glorious hope and consolation concerning those who sleep in Christ as believers. Thank you that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ and that our Lord Jesus has prepared a place for those of us who have placed our faith in Him. We thank you, Lord, that you are personally coming back to raise us from the grave and receive us to yourself to dwell in eternity with you. Lord, I ask for the family and for the loved ones and friends that there might be recognition that while death is our enemy, it's been conquered by the Lord and that he works all things together for good to those who love him. Lord, we also recognize and rest in the promise of Scripture that precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And the death for the believer is going home, a relief from pain and sorrows of this life. May there be a casting of our care upon you with the ability that's needed to focus on what death means to our dear friend who is now with you. And we ask that you would comfort and strengthen in the days ahead the family members, the friends, and allow us to draw strength and comfort from you. We ask all these things in the name of King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, even Jesus Christ our Savior, who's coming again. Amen. This